We're going to do things a little different this morning. If you would open your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to take a little bit of a break this morning from our study in the book of Revelation. And we're going to cover some of the issues um, that we're going to look at moving forward as a church with uh, both our church and in our denomination. And so I'm going to, I'm going to take just a, a short opportunity to talk about what we're going to do as a church, and then we're going to worship a little bit more, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit um, of our experience when we went to the annual meeting, the, the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting that we went to in June. And so I, I, this will be a time for us as a church just to kind of talk for a little bit and have an opportunity to, to know and kind of get a picture of where we're going in the future. And so I'd love to do that. When I was 13 or 14, I can't remember the year exactly, but we were in Bolivia, and I experienced my first and only earthquake. Has anybody been through an earthquake, like a legit earthquake, where you where you felt the ground shake and everything? A few over here, a couple over here, and, and Jeff as well. So your stories are probably much better than my story. My story, the earthquake was actually, the epicenter of it was a thousand miles away in Chile. We just felt the very edges of it. But I was awake that night, and it wasn't like my room was shaking or anything. It was just like you sat there and you felt like something was wrong. Like there was something deep inside me that just said, I don't feel right. There's something wrong. And so I noticed that just real slow, one of my books that was on my shelf just went and did this. And it just slowly fell off the side of my bookshelf. And I thought, this is nuts. I'm going crazy. What's happening? I knew it was an earthquake, but nobody else was awake. And when I told them in the morning, they didn't believe me because they hadn't felt the, the ground shake. They hadn't felt anything like that. My dad said, you were sleepwalking or you, you, were, you were just, it was a dream. This wasn't real. And so then we drove downtown that day and we saw several of the buildings as we went downtown had big cracks running all the way through the side. of them. And I said, I told you so. I knew something had happened. And in fact, one of the buildings that we saw downtown had been completely demolished in this in this earthquake now my experience will never be on cnn i'm not going to ever be interviewed and they say what a survivor you are you know your books kind of fle uh, kind of uh, went off the shelf a little bit but as i looked at that and i thought about that to this day i still think we felt the effects of that earthquake a thousand miles away it's it's amazing to me especially looking at that building that collapsed when you look at that that building that collapsed it was not built on a sure foundation that's the key to this. It was makeshift. All it took was the edge of an earthquake for this building to completely topple over. And Jesus spoke about this in, in our faith as well. He said there was a man who built his house on the sand. He didn't build it on, on a good solid foundation. He built it on the sand. And what happened when the storm came? The house was destroyed. And it says, and not only was it destroyed, but great was the fall of that house. Listen, church. A storm is coming. A storm is coming for this church. We're feeling just the very first tremors of it. We're feeling the very first edges of, of the ground shaking when culture changes. And the church has got to decide right now, where is our foundation going to be? If we think it's bad now, you look at the news and you think, man, this is terrible. How could it get any worse? Just wait. It's not going to get better. If we think that we're being persecuted now because of our faith, just wait. It's going to get worse. If we feel like our rights are being stripped away, just wait. It's going to get worse. If we think Satan is prowling around now and, and, he's, and he's attacking now, just wait. It's going to get worse. This world is putting a vice grip on the church. It's increasing the pressure to conform and to compromise more every day. And you know what the worst thing that I see today is, is that churches by the hundreds and by the thousands are giving into the pressure and they're compromising with the world. Why? Why would a church look at what the world says and say, okay, I'm going to go along with that. G give me something. Talk to me. Why would a church say yes to compromise with the world? It's easier. What'd you say? Yeah, more people. They think, yeah, my, if my doors are open as wide as they can be, then, then more people will come in for sure. What else? 
Financial, yeah. I'm afraid of losing our, our tax-exempt status. We may have to pay taxes. Well, what about this? What if, what if the government comes down on us because of this? Yeah, financially. Or, or givers. What if the givers don't, don't stay? What else? Why would a church compromise with the world? Not standing on God's word. They don't know what they believe. When your church doesn't know what they believe, then, then anything that comes along, any wind of doctrine, as James says, is going to topple them over. It's more convenient. When you compromise, there's no fight to be had. When you give up, you're not going to suffer. And so churches are doing this by the hundreds of thousands. Churches full of cowardly men are bending the knee to the will of the world. And we're seeing it in all of the mainline denominations. Every time you look at the high church settings, you're seeing that they're becoming increasingly ineffective and and, and non-entities in this world because, and it's crazy because we think, well, if I do this, we'll get more people. If I, if I compromise, we'll get more money if I do this. But what happens is that you just lose all your influence and you become a a, a worthless waste of space. I'm going to be real blunt today. Okay. Is that all right with everybody? Every time that a church bows to culture instead of Christ, the end is near for them. They're not going to survive. Because the church is not going to be able to stand when the ground of culture shakes unless they're on a solid foundation. And this is just going to get worse and worse. And we know this. We're in the midst of a study in the book of Revelation. And what are we going to see? Are we going to see by the end of all things that that the world just gets so much better and we reach this utopia level and everybody's getting along and everything's wonderful? No, it gets worse and worse and worse to the point where it says in Romans 8 that our, our earth, The creation itself groans to be made new. It groans for the day that Christ will come and make all things new. And Christ will come. And he will judge this world in his righteous fury and wrath. But until that day, church, we're here. And we have a mission to accomplish in this world. Until that day when Christ comes and rescues us, we're going to feel the earth shake with Satan's fury. Because he knows that his time is limited. He understands. He knows. If if we sit here and think that Satan doesn't understand Scripture, he does. He he looks at Scripture. He knows his time is short. And so his goal, his one goal, is to make the church compromise, to cripple the influence of the church, and to destroy the faith of God's people. Until that day, when Christ comes, what will we do as a church? We will stand on the truth of God's Word. Where culture says do this and they push against us, we're going to say, you know what? God's word says this, and no matter what you say, we're going to believe it, we're going to follow it, we're going to submit to it. We will make the scriptures our sure and solid foundation. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm only going to cover a couple of verses here, but I want to look at, I just want to look at that first verse in the chapter. Somebody read that out real loud for me. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. Paul, I mean, that's not a, that's not a great picture that he's painting for his protege, Timothy, is it? Timothy's a young man in the ministry. He's just taking over the the, the pastor or the the eldership of the church at Ephesus. He's learning from Paul. He's wanting to grow. And so Paul gives him this advice. Hard times are going to come in the last days. That's not what you want to hear, is it? Don't don't we want to hear in the church, didn't you come this morning? I mean, don't most people come wanting to be encouraged? And I want to come home just feeling great and feeling uplifted. But Paul looks at Timothy and says, listen, man, it's not going to get better. Hard times are going to come. That's the word kalipos in the Greek, and it means harsh, fierce, savage, or violent. Your version may say perilous or difficult. That word for when he says hard times, that word is only used one other time in the New Testament. And it's to describe the maniac of Gadara who was filled with a legion of demons. And it says he was so violent that nobody could come near him. So Paul says, listen, Timothy, don't be naive. Things are not going to get better. We can't think that by legislating morality, things are going to get better. That doesn't mean we don't try, but it just means that as we look at our nation moving forward, we got to understand we're not moving toward a perfect place. 
Now we will be in a perfect place one day when Christ comes and rescues his church and consumes this world in his fury and wrath and rebuilds a wonderful paradise for his people forever. But as we look at where we are now, as we look forward as, as a church in the midst of a wicked culture, we got to understand and be ready and prepare for this. And what the church needs now more than anything else is men and women of courage and commitment who are going to stand on the truth of God's word. That's what we need, church. We don't need people to look at culture and say, well, if we compromise, maybe we can be a witness to them. No, when you compromise, you lose your witness. When you compromise on, on some of these issues that the world is pushing and, and, and kind of putting a vice grip on us, we're losing all our witness. We're losing all our effectiveness. So in verses 2 through 9 in 2 Timothy 3, Paul is listing all the different ways that Satan is attacking the church. And he's going he's gonna to attack the church through outright sin and wickedness. He's, he's going to make it blatant and obvious. He's going to attack the church through these things. He's going to attack the church through deception and compromise. He's going to worm his way into the church, and he's going to get us to compromise with the world. And we're going to say, well, you know, if we just compromise on this issue, then they're not going to come down as hard on us later on. Well, the truth is, if you compromise on these issues, then there's not going to be any reason for the government to come down on us. Because they're going to look at us, and we're not going to be a threat to them. We're not going to be a threat to the world, and we're not going to be a threat to Satan when we've compromised with the world. He's going to do it as well through hypocrisy and counterfeit Christianity. I had a conversation with somebody this week, and he asked me a question. I'd like you to think about this. He said, what percentage of people that attend church on a Sunday are really believers in Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about people who attend church. I'm not talking about people who um, have prayed a prayer when they were a kid. I'm talking about how many people, what percentage are real, true, redeemed, born-again believers? And so I want you to think about that, that question. You know, what, what, what ideal goal are we going to set for our church? What would we want to say? 100%. Wouldn't we want to? Why would you say anything less? Obviously, we want people that come in our doors to know the truth of the gospel, to know that on our own we could never be saved, but God redeemed us so gloriously and so mercifully. And if we trust in him as our Savior, he will forgive our sins. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will fill us with his Holy Spirit and promise us an eternal home in heaven someday. Obviously, I would want all of us to know that and believe that this morning. But this person I was meeting with said this, I, I, don't, I don't know if 30% of people in church are really believers. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to go that far. But that, that scares me to wonder how many people are just coming to church because it's what we've done our whole life. And in East Texas, it's such a cultural thing. You ask almost anybody that you meet in this area, are you, are you a Christian? Yeah, of course, I've been to church. My grandma took me to church when I was a little kid. And, but the thing is, it's not about who took you to church when you were a kid. It's about right now, do you have a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ? And so you see this, that Satan, he's doing everything he can. He is attacking the church. He is using every tool at his disposal and it seems on the surface that he is incredibly successful at demeaning the influence of the church in this world and clouding the witness of the gospel. He's crippling us, church, and we're letting him. We're letting him. So many churches have let the lion into the living room, and then we wonder why our kids are getting attacked. So many churches have given the keys to the congregation over to Satan, over to culture, and with that, they've signed their own death certificates. So through, the, inter through the, the inspiration of God's Spirit, Paul shows us the way forward. So if the world is aimed at us and Satan is attacking us as a church, what is the way forward? He reads this. Let's read this together. This is what he gives his protege Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 10. I'm going to ask you to stand with me to give honor to the reading of God's Word. He says this to Timothy, but you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, 
You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, how much of scripture? All scripture is inspired by God. That means breathed out by God. And is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. For what purpose? Verse 17, so that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated, church. Church, if we want to stand when the ground of culture begins to shake, then where are we going to stand? We're going to stand on the truth of God's word. Anything else, if you build your life on anything else, you're going to find it to be insufficient. You're going to find it to crumble beneath you. It seems like right now there's a couple of issues that, that have come up, and I want to I kind of dig into a few issues. One of them, very recently in Texas, we've signed a bill, and it's become a law now, the heartbeat bill, and it has become the focus of the world's attacks on this issue of abortion. But church, I'm, I'm just going to say this real plain. I don't care if the Justice Department or the Supreme Court or the President himself tells us that we must accept abortion and expand access to it. It's not right. I I don't care if the whole world pushes against us on this topic. Where are we going to stand? On the word of God. And God's word says that every life is precious, that every child is known by God before they're even born, and that to take a baby's life in the womb is murder. And so we support organizations like Hope Pregnancy Center for this reason, to give struggling women options. Stand on God's word. You don't have to compromise with the world. You don't have to say, well, if we, if we make this our hill to die on, then, then we're going to face problems later on. Make it a hill to die on because God's word says it. It says protect those who cannot protect themselves. If God's word says that homosexuality is sin and it grieves his heart, then we cannot let culture bully us into compromise. If God says to flee sexual immorality and to keep the marriage bed pure, then we cannot let the world dictate our terms. And so men, if you're living with your girlfriend right now, or even if it's long term, do the right thing. Move out, get married, raise your kids in a godly home. Don't let the world dictate where we're moving. Don't let culture make us compromise. If God has told us that the only people qualified to be pastors of the church are called and qualified men, then we're not going to let the furious cries of feminists make us compromise with what God's word says to be true. If, if, If God's word says that in Christ there is no Jew or Greek, but we are all one in Christ Jesus, then we got to stop using the world's tools to solve a problem that sin has created and only the gospel can fix. If we want racial reconciliation in this world, it's not going to come through the world's systems. It's not going to come through legislation. It's going to come through the gospel, which brings men and women together under one banner of Jesus Christ. Over and over and over, the world is going to put these, this pressure on the church to compromise. And they're going to tell you over and over and over, it's not worth the fight. It is when God has made it clear. God's word is not muddy and it's not muddled. It's truth and we stand on it. Look what he says to Timothy in verse 10. You have followed my teaching. Timothy, you've followed my teaching. You've listened to the word from my very mouth. Now follow it. And then he says in Verse 14, he continues, says, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. You started in the faith. You started in trusting the scripture. Now keep going, Timothy. Keep walking in that path. The the world's vice grip on the church is going to get tighter, and it's going to get tighter. And the only way forward for us right now is to commit to trust and follow God's word. The church, it is going to cost us we got to be honest about this. It's going to cost us. Verse 12 says this. All who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. How does this fit into the health and wealth gospel movement? 
How does that fit in? Because in, in health and wealth, if you listen to Joel Osteen or one of, them, one of these preachers, they'll get up and say, if you have enough faith, then everything in your life is going to go well. Your bank accounts are going to be uh, skyrocketing and God's going to provide you homes and, and all these things, cars and all these different things. But how does this fit in? Because Paul tells Timothy, if you want to pursue what God wants you to pursue, then the world is going to push back and you're going to be persecuted for it. Listen to me, church. It's better to be persecuted than to be a coward. It's better to suffer for the name of Jesus than to compromise and become a worthless, powerless, and useless church. God is going to save us and rescue us from persecution one way or another. Either he is going to give us the strength to endure persecution, like he says here in verse 11, he says, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. Either he's going to give us the strength to endure or he's going to take us home to heaven to be with him forever. Either way, we win. There is no scenario when you stand on the truth of God's word, there is no scenario where you lose. The book of Romans says the overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who saves us. If God did this for us, listen to me, just think for a moment what God did for you through Christ Jesus. If God took your sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west, if he forgave you of everything that you've ever done wrong and, every, and everything that you will do wrong, if he redeemed you and forgave you, if he poured his mercy and his grace out on you, if he loved you and adopted you as his own sons and daughters, if he filled you with his Holy Spirit and he promised you a home in heaven with him someday, then any suffering that we're going to go through, any time that culture stands against us is absolutely worth it because we have the greatest treasure that we will ever experience and that's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, there's only one way forward. We stand on the truth of God's word. All scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Don't we want this for our church? that the man of God, that the men and women of God be complete and equipped for every good work. Wouldn't we want that? What an army we would unleash on this wicked world if every single one of us said, you know what, I'm not going to bow to culture, I'm not going to compromise with this world, but I'm going to stand on God's truth. And we are trained and rebuked and equipped in righteousness. The word shapes the church. We've got to understand this, that the, the, the Protestant Reformation that happened in the 1500s, it, it, it gave us back, it helped us reclaim this idea. The church doesn't decide what the Bible says. The church doesn't decide what, what God was trying to say through Scripture. The Scripture forms and shapes the church. It, it, it determines what we believe. God's Word is what we believe and what we stand on. It's not a prop. It's not a ceremonial relic. We don't just stick it up here so that everybody can see this is something that we talk about, but it's not really anything important for us. No, it is the power of God unto salvation. It, it is living and breathing and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. I love what A.W. Tozer said in his book, Experiencing God's Presence. He said this, regarding God's word, let us love it and live in it and eat it and drink it and lie down on it and walk on it and stand on it and swear by it and live by it and rest in it. I love that. He said, it's God's word. There's nothing else. There's, there's no other path that we can take because when we compromise, we lose all our effectiveness. When we compromise, the most important thing we're going to see is that God looks at us as failures. One of the things that we're going to talk about in a little bit is at the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting, the thing that kept getting brought up is the eyes of the world are watching. The world is watching. The world, careful what you say, the world is watching. And while I understand that, what we should be more concerned about is that the eyes of God are watching our church. The eyes of God are watching our lives, watching our conduct, watching what's happening in our hearts. When a church stands on God's word, we're supplied with God's power, and we build God's kingdom all for God's glory. The church, we're going to stand on God's word. I'm going to pray. I know this is out of order, but we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a few songs, and then... Um, we're going to move forward in our service, but uh, join me in prayer. Father, I love you, Lord, and I thank you. I pray that you'd give us courage to stand. I pray that you would not have us be cowards, Lord, but that, you, that we would stand on the truth of your word, no matter how severe the pressure 
becomes, that we would be true to you so that at the end of all things, we would stand in your presence and you would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, it's for your glory. We, we, we don't want to be ineffective in this place. You've called us to be ambassadors of, of your reconciliation through the gospel. And I pray that through our witness, that this world would, would come to understand their sin and the, the depths of their depravity and the heights of mercy that we have in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would use us in this place as we stand for the truth of God's word. I pray that you would use us to be witnesses in this world, that we would go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We would teach them to observe all the things that you've commanded us. And we trust you, Lord, tonight or this morning. We trust you that you'll be with us to the very end of the age. Give us courage. Give us commitment. Help us, Lord, to stand on the truth of your word. We know that we can't be sanctified without you. We need your word and your spirit to lead us into truth. And so I ask you, Lord, to give us this week a just an incredible hunger for the truth of Scripture, that we would do what Tozer said to, to eat it and rest in it and lie on it and, and walk in it and live by it. We love you, Lord. I thank you for this church. So grateful for them, Lord. I pray that you'd protect them from Satan's attacks. I pray that you'd give them the strength to endure. In your name, amen.